Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining today's event. A special welcome to Professor Dr. László Rovó, Rector of the University of Szeged. <laughs> Dr. Judith Fendler, Chancellor of the University of Szeged. <laughs> Jeff Magian Calder, Chief Executive Officer of Coursera. Professor Dr. Gábor Szabó, Chairman of the Foundation for the University of Szeged. <laughs> Special welcome to all representatives of Coursera, management of the University of Szeged, all our distinguished guests, and the press representatives. This day, we celebrate a milestone, a remarkable milestone for the University of Szeged, as we renew our cooperation agreement with Coursera, the world's largest education platform. I would like to ask first Professor Dr. László Rovó, Rector of the University of Szeged, to open today's event. Ladies and gentlemen, dear guests, a special welcome to Mr. Jeff Magical and Galada. I don't know how to pronounce it <laughs> perfectly, sorry, the, the CEO of the Coursera. Uh, just to demonstrate the difference uh, between the past and the future, I will keep my presentation, my speech, uh, through a fixated microphone platform. But we will see what is the future, <laughs> Jeff. Okay, so the world has significantly changed in the last decade. Practically everyone's pocket or hand, there is an electronic communication device which connects them to each other, creating a new dig digital social neocortex. This fundamentally changed the behaviors of our, on the, our ways and the way of life, so we must find the advantages of this fantastic option, especially in the education, to win the contest for the future. Our university has proved the engagement to be successful in this process in the last centuries, and I do believe this contribution will be the further important step ahead on this way. The University of Szeged is the best in Hungary and the first in Europe. The best according to the 2023 International QS World University Ranking, and the first in the constant unprecedented level of cooperation with the world's largest online education platform. We have a common goal with Coursera, to create a complex higher education service system, unprecedented in Europe with the world class joy, relevant learning and students and expand the social responsibility of a higher education. In 2020, the first step of the relationship between the University of Szeged and Coursera was a reaction to the changes in the world. Coursera supported our transition to online education due to the COVID epidemic with free licenses. By aligning our resources, we reacted and adapted to the changes. It showed us that the future would be about adaptation, cooperation, and reinforcing each other. As a result of the, for the development by the University of Szeged, the Coursera program, Learning How to Learn, has been launched as the first course available in Hungary, attracting more than 8,500 students. Learning How to Learn offers learning methodology, ideas, and advice to help students to study effectively and successfully. From 20, uh, 24 secondary school students will also be able to redeem this knowledge for institutional points, boosting their application scores. The University of Szeged has 12 faculties, a nationally outstanding clinical center, full of world-class lecturers, physicians, researchers, and motivated students following in their footsteps. Our priority is to provide our students and lecturers with opportunities to study, learn, and live in an international environment. We intend to focus on this area by developing our network of contracts. Thanks to this agreement, I trust that our students and staff members will take advantage of this unique opportunity, increasing number, and that both parties will benefit from this cooperation. More than 100 million people are studying the Coursera. I'm sure that many people definitely cannot be wrong. From now on, all students of the University of Szeged can become members of this community. Based on our experience, our students are doing excellent in courses related 
to IT, for example, in the field of data scientists and programming. Thanks to the extensive use of Kurzar platform in the University of Szeged, a complete map of the university can be drawn and measures and processes the skills, thus the targeted and in the disciplinary development of skills can be given even greater emphasis, emphasizes through its education. We are proud that following today's agreement, we will join the elite of the elite among the universities connected to Coursera. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for your kind words. Uh, up next, I would like to ask Jeff Magiancalda, CEO of Coursera, to hold his welcoming speech. Thank you, and thank you for having me. I think this is the most beautiful room I've ever spoken in. It's a privilege to be here, and uh, we really value the partnership. Coursera was started 11 years ago by two professors uh, from Stanford, Daphne Kohler and Andrew Ng, both who teach computer science. From the very beginning, it was a collaboration. A collaboration started in Silicon Valley. And you know, there's a lot of people, I, I've been a CEO in Silicon Valley for 25 years. I had the pleasure before Coursera to be the first employee of a company called Financial Engines, which was founded by a Nobel Prize winner in economics, Bill Sharp. And, and being in Silicon Valley, there are some things that are true, but there are some things that are myths. And one of the myths is that some genius comes and starts a company that becomes successful all on their own. I think the story of Coursera is more true, which is it almost always is a collaboration. In the earliest days, it was a collaboration between Andrew and Daphne. That expanded to include a collaboration among many uh, top universities, uh, Michigan and Princeton and Yale and Duke and Stanford. But what really has driven the innovation at Coursera are partners that we can work with who help push the boundaries. The only way that a startup company becomes a bigger company is by learning and changing and growing. And the only way for us to learn is to work with partners who will take risks with us, who will forge into new territories with us. And what is really wonderful about working with Seged is that it is very rare that a company who is innovative can find a partner who is both innovative and willing to take risks and who has so much to lose because they're at the very top of their game. Find me the number of institutions at the top of their game who are willing to really push the boundaries of innovation. And I will show you Seged University as a great example of this kind of an institution. It is an honor to have worked with you. Uh, we launched Coursera for Campus in October of 2019. Now, we did not know that there was gonna be a pandemic coming four months later. But Seged was at the very beginning, even before the pandemic, looking at this offering and evaluating it, in the very earliest stages, utilizing it, pushing the boundaries, and really moving forward even after things open back up again. We call this Lighthouse 2.0 because this is the next generation of what we're doing together between Seged and Coursera. I think the utilization of Coursera has been fascinating. I think learning how to learn, uh, it's a fantastic course. It's one of the global most popular courses in almost every country. But for an institution to take such an important topic, how do we learn and how can we practice habits that allow us to learn more rapidly? Talk about an essential future skill. Learning ability, learning agility. These are some of the most important things that young people can learn. And to take a course and translate it into Hungarian and make it available not just to students, but to anyone even interested in coming to Seged University, I think is a great service to the community. And I think it's a great example of how fundamentally this university is trying to create opportunities to transform not just people's lives, but the way they think as well. When I think about where we're gonna go next in terms of Lighthouse 2.0, it's gonna be an exciting world. And the fact that we're now expanding the ability for all students and all faculty and all staff to use all of the courses on Coursera, 
I think will open up new horizons for us to further innovate in the years ahead. So thank you for having me here. It's a real pleasure, and uh, we're excited about our future together. Thank you. Thank you for your welcoming words. And now it is time for the renewal of the cooperation agreement. I would like to ask Professor Dr. Laszlo Rovo, Dr. Judith Fender, and Jeff Magiancolda to sign the agreement. And now I would like to ask all three parties to step to the button and press it as to symbolize. Yes. 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 So now by pressing the button, you will symbolize the launch of this agreement. And now I would like to ask Jeff Magiancalda to please hold your keynote speech. Thank you. Great. All right, well, thank you for, for joining. I have some thoughts that I'd like to share about what we're seeing at Coursera. You might have seen some of the statistics. In the earliest days of Coursera, we offered courses directly to individuals. Um, but about seven years ago, we started offering Coursera for business. And this is a version of Coursera for businesses to upskill and reskill their employees, especially in data science, computer science, and business. A year later, we launched Coursera for government. And then as I mentioned, in October of 2019, we launched Coursera for campus. Since the pandemic has uh, opened up a little bit and we can travel again, I've been traveling tremendously. <laughs> I love traveling. And uh, when I do travel, I talk to learners, I talk to businesses, I talk to governments, and I talk to campuses. And so this is sort of a point of view of what we see happening around the world with learning and education, and especially jobs, globally. So I'll start with this picture here, one of my favorites. When people think about education, and they think about what's the role of education. Now I'm biased, and I suspect that many of you sitting here in the audience are also biased, but when you look at the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, which were created in 2015 to do nothing less than create prosperity for humans and to protect the planet, one of these goals is more important, in my opinion, than all the others. And that's SDG number four, education. And the reason that I believe education is so powerful and the reason that I feel honored to be here and to be working at Coursera is that education is the way that we address inequalities. Education is the way that we help 
produce and consume in a more responsible and sustainable way. Education is the basis of social justice and strong institutions. Education is the way that we gain knowledge and skills and abilities to have highly productive uh, economic opportunity and economic growth. Education is the way that we understand and help protect our climate. Education is the way that we understand and manage our health, our physical health, and our mental health. Education is also the way that we eliminate hunger and eliminate poverty as well. So when I think about education, I really do see it as the root cause of human progress and prosperity. And as the world faces so many challenges, I believe and feel honored to work with you that educators and education will be the most important thing that we can do to move humanity forward. So we have a number of challenges that we are now facing. These are obvious. Uh, they're all over the news. One is that education is unequal. Access to education has been unequal. And what that does is it leads to unequal economic opportunity. It creates a lot of disparity between the haves and the have-nots. Automation, as I'll talk about, automation and the pandemic both had disparate impacts that really negatively harmed people who had the least amount of access to education. And there's a large expectation that inequality is going to grow even further uh, unless we can educate people because many, many jobs are going to be automated. So we have these growing trends of inequality. They have been accentuated by the pandemic and technology threatens to further inequality even more. Now, this is a chart from uh, Oxford University and I'll just describe it here in, in a little bit of detail. So on the x-axis is the risk of job automation uh, from least vulnerable to most vulnerable. On the y-axis is annual average wages. The size of the bubble is the number of people in that job. This is at least in the US, but it's pretty similar across countries. And then the color is the typical education level of people in this job. So red is no formal education, blue is a college degree. So you see all these bubbles and something stands out immediately. All those really big bubbles in the lower right of the screen. These are cashiers, waiters, retail sales, freight movers, personal care aides. These are people in very low wage jobs who typically don't have any formal education and whose jobs are more predictable and repeatable and therefore highly vulnerable to automation. Now the other thing that you can notice on this chart are those light blue bubbles in the, in the upper left. So these are the folks with college degrees. These are the people making good wages, the business operations specialists, the general managers, the lawyers, the specialized coders, the IT managers, and they are in jobs that at least so far have been far less predictable and likely to be automated. What the whole world is really focused on right now is the need to provide the knowledge and skills to people who are less skilled and are more likely to have their jobs be automated so that they have a chance to get these new job opportunities that will create, be created because of technology. It's knowledge, it's skills, it's credentials, it's the things that this university offers that will be required for far more people than have ever had access before. It's very possible that there can be many, many job openings in the near future and very high unemployment rates because the people who have lost their jobs don't have the skills and the knowledge to do the new jobs. So the whole transformation of our labor force is going to require education. Now, I just modified this chart in the last few weeks. How many of you have been using ChatGPT? Okay. It's mind-blowing. It's really a stunning technology. I rarely have I seen anything that is as astonishing as ChatGPT. It's, it's AI. It's a new class of, of artificial intelligence that they call general, uh, sorry, generative uh, AI. And it's using new models that are fairly recent. They were only, these transformer models were only really pioneered by Google in 2015. And now they're getting to a size where they have really amazing and powerful 
uh, capabilities to generate text and to generate images, and they're working on generating, they can generate sound, and they will soon be able to generate video. I think there's a real question, and I won't go into this in detail, but if anybody wants to talk about it, this is all I've been th thinking about lately, is once you can automate certain cognitive skills, then perhaps these knowledge jobs will also become more vulnerable. vulnerable. I think, to me, what it really means, though, is the need for education has been big, and it's not just going to be for people in the traditionally more vulnerable positions. I think it will be for others, too. And, you know, lawyers would be one. Anything that involves summarizing, categorizing, analyzing bodies of text, this technology can do very, very well. It can generate new uh, text, but it's really good at summarizing and, and transforming existing bodies of text. So, so technology is going to be a huge uh, factor for our civilization. And when we think about this, this is from Bain and Company in 2022. They said the big challenge ahead will be determining how to trans, uh, transform our workforce so that people can get access to these new jobs. And so this major transition is going to be driven primarily by education. So what kinds of jobs are in high demand? This is a chart from, on the left side, it's the top jobs from the World Economic Forum. So you can see AI, ML learning specialist, data analyst, information security, Internet of Things, big data, project managers, uh, FinTech, digital marketing, software applications. The, these are the jobs, according to the World Economic Forum, with the highest rate of increase in demand. And on the right, there's a chart from Microsoft that suggests over the five years from 2020 to 2025, about 150 million new jobs will be created heavily in software development, cloud and data, data analysis, cybersecurity that didn't exist before. So there's a tremendous demand for skilled talent. And the question is, how do we make more equal access to the education that can teach these kinds of skills in order for people to land these kinds of jobs? And whether it's these jobs or another set of jobs in another three years, maybe it'll be a different 10, what I can tell you is this, education will be the key to have the agility for individuals to transform their skills and therefore transform the opportunity set that's available to them. And I believe that universities will play a central role in, in, in allowing that transformation. Here's a chart that we put together um, that talks about where the big IT and related growth is. Uh, growth in tech, ICT, uh, and professional services since 2014. You can see Hungary is pretty much at the top of the list at 41% cumulative average growth rate among uh, all these European countries. Um, and so really this, this is where an awful lot of the rate of increase in job opportunities in the IT and technical sectors is happening. And I was also uh, very excited to learn from the European Center for Entrepreneurship that Budapest ranks as the region with the second highest concentration of knowledge intensive jobs in all of Europe. So where we are right now um, at this university, you know, in this country, uh, on this continent, I think is a really special time. And I think it's fitting that a university here in Seged will be leading the way, not just in providing new skills, but pioneering new collaborations and new partnerships to discover how we can use technology and a world of international knowledge to really be of assistance to the students and the faculty and the staff here at the university. Now, I want to talk a little bit about remote work. So before the pandemic, I was a CEO that was very old fashioned. I wanted everybody to come to the office. I just thought, you know what, there's too many distractions and there's too much benefit of collaboration. So, you know, we used to always come to the office. And then the pandemic came, of course, we had to close the office. And we knew when we closed the office that we were never going to force everybody to come back to the office. And the reason is because we believed that once individuals had the flexibility to not have to commute to an office every day, if we tried to force our employees to come back after the lockdown ended, our employees would say, I'm not coming back. I'm going to go to some other company that will allow me to work remotely and allow me to have that flexibility. Maybe not everybody would be able to find that job, but computer scientists and data scientists are in very high demand, and the best ones 
choose where they want to work. And so I didn't want to lose our very best data scientists and computer scientists, so we said, you know what, even though I don't like the idea, we're going to embrace this idea that people can work from anywhere, because if we don't, Twitter or Netflix or Google or Facebook or Apple or all these companies that are around, uh, around where we're headquartered, someone's going to hire our people. So at first, it was just playing defense. But then I said, you know, we can play offense too. Not only can we protect our people from leaving and going to some other company, but we can now recruit the best talent anywhere in the world. You know, we might be based in California, but we could hire people in Bogota. We could hire people in Lima. We could hire people in Zeged. We can hire people anywhere in the world who have the skills to do the jobs that we need done at Coursera. And so we adopted in 2020 a work from anywhere policy. And even as you hear in the press, many tech CEOs saying you have to come back to the office, my belief is, and, and someone actually gave me this quote, they said, there's a war for talent and talent won. <laughs> I think that individuals, talented individuals, they will determine what the work from uh, home policies are gonna be. And companies will basically, ha in order to be competitive, they're gonna have to embrace more flexibility for the most talented folks. Another thing is, if you look at the impact of remote work on women, especially women with families, younger children, it is a massive difference in preference. There was a McKinsey study that just said nine out of 10 women in the US prefer to mostly work remotely. So if you're a company that embraces a you have to come to the office policy, good luck building a representative leadership team. Good luck recruiting women in technology. It has a different impact. That policy of having to come to work has a different impact on, based on your gender. It also, there's a lot of evidence that shows that underrepresented groups also really prefer greater flexibility in when they come to work and when not. So I think for diversity, if you really want to build a representative uh, team, well-represented team, this policy of, of working remotely is, is very important, and we've embraced it. Now, people will say, Jeff, you know, not every job can be done remotely. There are jobs in cleaning and maintenance, in construction, in hospitality, manufacturing, agriculture, healthcare. True. I'm not saying every job can be done remotely. But business, education, management, office administration, scientific and technical, these are some of the highest demand jobs in the world. The highest demand digital jobs can be done remotely. And so you're gonna see, we are seeing a huge expansion in remote job opportunities. So when you look at percentage of uh, remote work by country and over time, the light blue bubbles are 2019. You can see that the greatest incidence of remote work uh, before the pandemic was in the US. Not surprisingly, during the pandemic, yeah, lots of countries had much higher remote work happening. That was, that's to these middle blue, that's in 2022. But what Gartner says, you know, separate from what a lot of people are saying, which is, oh, we're all gonna go back to the office because uh, pandemic lockdown has ended. Gartner says, we're gonna keep going more and more towards remote work. And I think that this is true. I think that this is true because the competition for talent is so intense and the need to build more diverse workforces is so important. So I think remote work is here to stay, not in every position and it won't happen overnight. Um, but when I travel around the world, uh, I talk to uh, CHROs. These are the business leaders who are hiring people. Now this was from a, a, a um, survey that was done in 2021. But the question was, what's making it difficult to recruit workers? Now, the highest ranking answer was inability to find the right skills at the right price in the market. That's not too surprising. My guess is that was pretty typical even before the pandemic. Second was higher government stimulus and unemployment benefits during the pandemic. People didn't have to come to work because they were getting subsidies. I understand that. But look at number three. This one I had never seen before. What's making it difficult to recruit workers is new competitors for talent giving flexible working practices outside of my normal geographic scope. Like, what does that mean? That means international companies are stealing my employees and allowing them work to work remotely. Okay, when I was in Delhi, when I was in Singapore, when I was in the Philippines, when I was in Bogota, when I was in Lima, Peru, the companies are telling me we are losing our best people because international companies in Europe and the US are offering remote work to people sitting in Lima or Bogota or all around the world. I believe that the job opportunities for students in Zeged will be absolutely global. If they're not already there, that is what is happening. 
If you develop the right skills, the opportunity for jobs and careers will be vastly larger than the boundaries of this city or the boundaries of this country. And young people are realizing there is a global opportunity to have careers even without leave, leaving your community and without leaving your family. So I think there's a really exciting opportunity here. In 2021, 80% of CEOs said that they're gonna be offering more flexible remote work in order to attract and retain talent. I don't see any world where this is gonna change. Um, now, as I've flown around, especially when I was in India, I, I drew this little picture because I remembered many years ago when I was at Financial Engines, we had Indian outsourcing. We worked with a company in Noida and we had about 20 people, uh, engineers in India that were doing regression test script writing. Um, but we always had to work through a local office. So Coursera was, you know, a, uh, sorry, Financial Engines was a company. We would set up a local office or contract with someone and then they would recruit on the ground. This is the way things worked before the pandemic. And the need to have a local office put a lot of friction in the system. But this is where things are today. You have multinationals who are saying, there are skilled people all around the world. I can hire them directly. I don't need to set up an office in the region. I can hire someone in this country, this country, this country, and this country. I'll go right to the individual and I'll say, would you like to work for my company? And because they're doing this, the other companies are like, well, I better do this too. I can't lose out on this opportunity to hire talent that is really great in these emerging pools of talent. And so now all the companies start competing with each other directly with the talent. These could be students who are graduating from Seget University. The other thing that's happening, by the way, is the students are onto this, often faster than the career counseling uh, offices are, and they're saying, you know, if you don't call me, I'll call you. I was in Merida, Mexico at Anahuac University. All the students there are realizing if they learn English as a second language and they have skills that international employers want, they can land jobs and make far more money than what they can make working for a local employer. And so there's just a huge opportunity for students, actually anybody switching careers, but especially the students because they're so fluent in digital and they're getting the most current education to get a world of, of, of economic and job opportunities that never existed before. So I find that very exciting and I think being a young person today is gonna be filled with opportunities that parents never had. Uh, all right, so now let's talk a little bit about uh, Coursera. We're basically this ecosystem, as I mentioned, of educators, learners, and institutions, businesses, governments, and campuses. Um, we have been growing pretty rapidly. Clearly, the pandemic saw a big increase in the registered learners. We had 47 million learners going into 2020. Another 30 million joined in 2020 alone. So the pandemic really accelerated online learning, and of course, the pandemic also accelerated remote work. When we look at where our learners are, uh, this is sort of a distribution here. Uh, Europe, there's a, almost 20 million, growing at about 19%. Um, in Hungary, there are 161,000 learners who are on Coursera, many of them here at Seged University. And you can see the general size, you know, basically in terms of representation, UK, Spain, Germany, France, Italy uh, are the top five. Of course, the pretty consistent with their populations. When you look at the demographics, uh, what we find is that learners on Coursera are generally a little bit older. They're usually people who are really trying to push their career forward rapidly. Uh, 32 years is the average, the median age in Hungary is 34. It's almost 50-50 women and men, and the mobile in Hungary is uh, about the same as Europe, which is less than overall. Uh, on Coursera, but a lot of Coursera's population is in India, where it's very mobile, Southeast Asia, and Latin America. Well, also Africa. I mean, a lot of the emerging economies are mostly using Coursera on mobile devices, where they can not only watch the courses on their mobile phone, but they can actually download them and watch them offline if they don't have internet connectivity, which is a really important part of bridging the digital divide. So when we look at our partners who are publishing on Coursera, they include universities from all over the world. And when we also look at our industry partners, they include some of the largest and best known companies. And this kind of collaboration between industry and, and universities, I think is a wonderful collaboration. Universally, universities are distinctively good at teaching the more durable underlying concepts and knowledge 
that are going to not only be more durable, but will allow a student to transfer that knowledge to different domains. And as the world changes, I think understanding the deeper concept will be more resilient to change than just understanding the superficial skill. So I think universities are very good at providing well-rounded education in a social setting, and especially for those deep conceptual skills. And what industry is really good at is teaching about jobs and skills and tools. And you put those together and you kind of get the best of knowledge, skills, and that helps to really advance someone's abilities. Today, the catalog is fairly broad, over 5,000 courses across many different domains. Uh, we have, uh, of course, we started with, with just courses that mostly teach uh, um, concepts via lectures. We now have hands-on projects where you can build things using software tools. We introduce clips, which are very short videos so that you don't have to watch the whole course. It's like flipping to chapter five and then finishing the whole book if you're interested in that. And of course, assessments is a huge part of what we do. I will say that business technology and data science, those are the most popular courses for most students. Although, of course, we have you know, social sciences, health, arts, and humanities as well. So far at uh, Seged University and with Coursera, there have been almost 4,000 unique learners, 16,000 course enrollments, and over 60,000 hours that students, faculty, and staff have been spending on Coursera at, at Seged. And if you want to see the most popular courses taken by students, learning how to learn is number one. I couldn't think of a better course that everyone should be learning because it's really the most effective tool to utilize Coursera is to make sure that one approaches it with the right uh, strategy for learning rapidly. Uh, Excel, programming for everyone, successful presentations from University of Colorado Boulder. What is data science? Writing in English at university. I love Emory, biohacking your brain's health. You know, that's not one of our most popular globally, so that is very specific to, to, uh, to Seged. Influencing people, so soft skills, business skills, uh, tools for data science, and then Python for data science. So you can see mostly it's computer science and data science, but there's a lot of other important soft skills, business skills, communication skills that are high on the list as well. Now, where are we going in terms of the future of education? Many CEOs would tell you that universities do a great job with these fundamental concepts, but putting more industry and job-relevant content into the curriculum would be valuable for building more well-rounded students. Um, this is uh, a chart from 2020 on the most in-demand skills according to employers, so decision-making, uh, artificial intelligence, digital transformation, data analytics, these are all kind of high on the list. And um, when we interviewed uh, students, we asked some, many of them, how do you feel about the college degree that you earned? Almost everybody who gets a college degree is happy about that. So only 8% of graduates said they regret attending university. It's, this is a great experience that I don't think uh, can be substituted by online or anything else. I mean, coming to a place like this with peers, with faculty, is a wonderful experience. But 52% of students said they don't regularly use the skills that they learned, and only 42% thought that the university prepared them for the job that they were in. Now, what we're seeing and what we're doing with Seged is we're basically going to be addressing this by integrating industry micro-credentials into the curriculum. When we look across the world and we say, what are, what are universities really thinking about? Uh, I'd say one of the top trends is offering industry micro-credentials. These are sort of pro professional certificates that come from industry. We often call them career electives. So they're often not the core curriculum, but they're supplemental career-oriented courses and certificates that can round out an, a, a student's education. Um, they want to make sure that they can bring in advanced topics that maybe the, the faculty aren't able to teach today, like blockchain, cybersecurity, other emerging topics, um, making sure that those are, are, are available, and then, of course, making sure that faculty have access to this kind of content. Really, two things, making sure that the fluency with online train, uh, learning and the ability to author and also incorporate online resources from an international community of universities. Those are all important skills that, that, uh, that universities are looking for. So what we see universities doing and what is happening here at Seged is a lot of the core subjects will remain the same. 
the core curriculum will remain the same, but it might be the case that there are advanced electives that are offered in, in, in integrated into um, some of the existing courses, like in this case, if there's an electric systems design course taught by the university, there might be integrated material from Georgia Tech on uh, uh, intro to electronics. Or in data foundations, then the, the professor might decide to integrate something on algorithm and data structure from UC San Diego. So it's really almost like having guest lectures be able to address the students on topics that are harder to come by. And when we look at the, these career electives, uh, what we find is that students are very interested in complementing their college degree with these professional certificates from industry. 88% said that they thought a professional certificate would help them stand out. And when we interviewed employers, about three out of four said that they would rather interview a, a student who graduates with both a college degree and a professional certificate than just one. If we look at this by country, uh, this is the question, if a program included professional certificates as part of its curriculum, to what extent would it influence your decision to enroll? So students are looking for these career-relevant certificates when they make the decision about which university to go to. 75% said they'd be more likely to choose a school that offers this in the curriculum compared to one that does not. And then when we asked um, employers, how are you thinking about hiring students? Clearly the college degree is important, but more and more employers are also saying, I want to evaluate skills, not just the degree, but also the skills that an employee ha uh, a graduate has. And so this idea that, um, that, that students can show not just knowledge, but skills and how to use certain software tools is something that employers are really looking to do more and more. And when we asked, would you be more likely to hire a graduate who has an industry certificate and a college degree, what we found is that employers said they're on average about 76% more likely to consider hiring a student who has both a college degree and a, a professional certificate. So this whole idea that industry and higher education can collaborate by offering these career electives in the core curriculum or as, as electives in the degree curriculum for a student, I think is a trend that we are seeing all around the world and I would say that SEGED is at the very uh, early and visionary stages of ha making this happen in Europe. So when we look at this, I, re I really do think that this is about collaboration. We have industry certificates that are oriented towards entry-level jobs. We're really trying to link uh, job seekers and adults who are trying to switch careers uh, to courses from industry that make that happen. The way that we do this, and we do this with SEGED as well, is the university can brand this career academy so the students can go to their own school's career academy. We're also doing this with governments. So this is Kazakhstan. Uh, Kazakhstan just announced, I just announced in Davos last week, uh, I met with the Minister of Education a few weeks ago. Uh, they, uh, the Minister of Education, is going, are going to be implementing these career certificates through all the public universities in Kazakhstan. As, as a matter of government policy, they're gonna be supplementing the curriculum that's available through the public universities uh, in Kazakhstan. We also do this with employers. So L'Oreal is one of our big customers in Paris. They are building a career academy to help new people coming to the, to the, to the company and also employees at L'Oreal who wanna switch careers this set of industry certificates helps people make a career switch, which as things change faster and faster, will be more and more important. In terms of what's offered in these industry micro-credentials, it really starts with the job. What's a job that's in very high demand that doesn't require a lot of work experience and you can learn the skills online? These are jobs in software and IT, like database developer, which is a training program from Meta on, on database development. IT support from Google, uh, front-end web development from Meta, data analyst certificate from IBM. Uh, Google has a great certificate on UX design. So these are all careers that a young person graduating might want to explore, and they're available as professional certificate programs that can count as credit towards a college degree. And we have many more of these coming, including in healthcare, more in business, and of course, you know, a growing number of, of certificates in software and IT. So to sum it up, the world is changing really quickly. 
And when I first got to Coursera, I heard this phrase that's probably commonly known to, to most of you, which is that opportunity, well, talent is equally distributed, but opportunity is not. And what we've seen at Coursera because of the pandemic is that technology, on the one hand, is creating more inequality by automating jobs, but it also holds the promise to create greater opportunity and more equal opportunity. When technology allows online learning to, to help people get access to education no matter where they live, no matter where they're based, and when technology allows people to work remote jobs no matter where they are, no matter where they're based, suddenly a more equal opportunity to learn and a more equal opportunity to get good jobs is more available to more people. So we are really excited that this truism that uh, there has been inequality is being addressed uh, through the work that we're doing together. And again, it is a huge privilege uh, for me to be here, for the team to be here, and for us to really look at the next chapter of the relationship between Sega University and Coursera. I think the future is, is very exciting and we're happy to be a part of it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Maggi and Calder. We have some time to conduct a QA. and a uh, Just a short note for the press representatives, individual press interviews can be conducted after the event. So I would like to encourage all of the audience to ask some questions to Mr. Maggi and Calder. There are students in the room, look, here we go. Thank you for, uh, so much for the presentation. It was very inspiring and informative. So uh, I would like to ask you whether you have a favorite course on Coursera, and what would you advise students to take on Coursera? So what are the courses that the students should focus on? Yeah, so I mean, it's gonna sound like I made this up, but seriously, if you looked at my LinkedIn profile, the first course I ever took on Coursera was learning how to learn. And I loved it. I mean, I love neurobiology. I, 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 I'm, a, I'm a learner. I, I'm very curious. I like to learn things. And what I love about um, many of the courses on Coursera, you know, taught by professors, n you know, not on TikTok, but like real, actual, scientifically evidenced research is that you learn things that are actually meaningful. And so I think that learning how to learn course is incredible uh, because it teaches you how your brain works and it teaches you practices to be a quick learner and an effective learner. So that's kind of, that would be my recommendation for any student, seriously, it's like the most important ability that, that anyone's gonna have in a world that's changing faster and faster is the agility, the cognitive agility to learn new things to be productive and relevant in, in a workplace. And, and what that's gonna mean when, especially when technology is automating more things and new tools are being developed to do jobs, the ability to learn, change, and grow. I think that that's the key. So I'd say number one is, is learning how to learn. I would say another big one is data-driven decision-making. You know, I think that uh, every job involves decision-making. And increasingly, because we have so much data, the ability to make decisions based on data leads to far more sound decisions. And I think that's, that's part of the scientific method that is so key as to the way that universities study their discipline. I think there's so much decision-making today that happens on garbage information uh, that, that really has no basis, often completely biased by emotion. I mean, there's so much more opinions in media than actual facts and, 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 and evidenced research that I think it's really useful to say, what are the ways to make decisions that are, that are less biased and better informed by data? So that would be a second one would be data-driven decision-making. And then the third one would be something, I don't know if there's a particular course, um, and we have so many courses on interpersonal dynamics, kind of collaboration, teamwork, working with other people. No matter what the technology does, whether it automates you know, my job or, or someone else's job, humans will work together. You know, we're, we're gonna work together. And so I think the ability to have high emotional intelligence, be able to inspire people, relate to people, trust people. From what I've learned in business, 
part of the magic of working in a team is all agreeing on the same kind of goal and getting excited about that and then coordinating how you're going to work that, get that work done together. It's a lot of what happens in student projects on campus. But maybe I'd say those would be three that I would start with. Learning how to learn, data-driven decision-making, and collaboration and teamwork would be, would be, I think, good topics. I mentioned, uh, what, what would you say? I mean, based on your, based on your view of things, what, what, what are your thoughts? Well, uh, I'm not a student, so mm -hmm. I work at the University of Sagad. Mm -hmm. But uh, to be honest, after today's presentation, I'm very inspired to also start uh, using the Coursera because I think that it's never too late to learn something. <laughs> and I was very inspired by the presentation. So I think there is so much for me to learn as well. That's great. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, other questions? What is the role now of, uh, of the Coursera at the top-ranked universities mm -hmm. in the world? Uh, yeah, so the, the role of Coursera at the top-ranked universities, I would say that um, the, ma the majority of the U.S. universities who publish on Coursera, this is sort of Princeton, Duke, Stanford, et cetera, they offer uh, at least their courses on Coursera to their students. They often will offer other, others as well. So, so that's very common. And what we see is that offering the courses for credit really is influenced by the, um, the, acc the accreditation standards in a given country. So in India, this has really taken off. There's the government put out this new education policy a few years ago where they said that 40% of all credits on campus can be earned through online providers. And this University Grants Commission in India just ratified this about four weeks ago. So now in India, it's really become a big thing because the government said we, they have to train 30 million more students. They have about 30 million enrolled students today. They need to double that in the next three to five years. They cannot build enough universities. They do not have enough faculty. I mean, one of the things about the stuff I'm mentioning, turns out data, hiring faculty in data science is very expensive because there's a lot of businesses who hire those people who are very expert in data science and they pay them very big salaries. So creating the capacity to have cutting edge instruction in these new domains is, is very difficult. So we're seeing even the leading universities beginning to go this direction. I would say that in Europe, Seged is either the leader, I would say, I, I, I don't think there's any other school in Europe that is, uh, is moving at a faster, more innovative pace than Seged. I would say there are other uh, universities in a similar situation, but in other parts of the world. Yeah. Thank you. It was a great lecture. Thank you very much. Very motivating. Uh, I'm Beata Havashi, um, a medical doctor. And I would like to ask that whether you Coursera has a plan to approach the most uh, vulnerable. You mentioned in one of your first slides that there are um, big groups and jobs which are vulnerable for um, disappearing mm -hmm. and persons are losing the job. Mm -hmm. So um, I understand that you offer many very interesting courses for well-educated people. Yeah. And what is about the undereducated ones? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great question. The, you know, what we find is there are, there are vulnerable populations uh, for, for various reasons. Sometimes it's because uh, they didn't have a lot of educational access to education when they were younger. Um, one vulnerable population, I mean, it's a, it's a big global one, which is refugees, is something that we spend a lot of time with. I, I was just in Davos, and um, we were meeting with the uh, Minister of Economy from Ukraine. Uh, one of the things that happened right as the conflict started, um, the minister, minister of Higher Education reached out to Coursera and said, we're going to have a lot of folks moving. How can we help continue the educational process? We offered Coursera for campus for every academic institution in Ukraine, and, and including also people who have, who have left the country. And this conversation that we're having was, for refugees, not only can, and not just Ukrainian refugees, refugees all over the world. I mean, Syrian refugees, Afghanist, Afghani refugees. I mean, all the, there are many refugee populations, including climate-related refugees. 
Um, using online education is a really valuable tool because many people have varying levels of, of educational background, including very educated people who just, they can't take their credential to the new country and have it recognized. So helping uh, refugees get access to education and credentials. Also, in Ukraine, they're very interested in having uh, people who have left return. And so there's a question of how can we create meaningful employment opportunities when they're displaced, but how can we also prepare them to return back to their homes where we don't know exactly the condition and safety of, of what, what that's going to look like on the ground. And what we were talking about was the ability to use courses, especially these industry certificates, which are job aligned to learn the skills to do remote jobs. So not only can you learn to be a UX designer or a project manager if you're displaced, because you could do it online. When you learn those skills, you could potentially get a job in the area that you are displaced in. You could transfer those back to your home when you come back home. And even if there aren't those jobs in your home territory, those jobs are available remotely, and those are the kinds of jobs that you can do remotely. So I do think with respect to populations that are displaced, online learning and remote work for these entry-level digital jobs is what we're really leaning into. With respect to those who have had less education, we find that governments play a very big role, and universities also play a big role, sometimes in tandem. Governments do programs that we often call workforce development programs where they will often you know, put together uh, courses on uh, language fluency, uh, uh, personal well-being, socio-emotional health, parenting. Uh, some are more job-related, some are less job-related. They make those available at scale. And, and for government programs, that's nice because you can reach a very distributed population of people. So in the Middle East, you know, in Egypt, say, there are lots of folks concentrated in Cairo, but there's lots of folks who are distributed throughout the country. It's hard to reach all those uh, people with face-to-face -face programs. So online programs are, have been very good for, for workforce development. Uh, and then I would also say that universities, like in the US, um, we have a, a vocational system called community colleges. So many governments are working with the vocational systems of education to create opportunities like the previous question, which was for a working adult who decides, I want to change careers. I, I would like to have more flexibility. Uh, I would like to make some more money. I would like to do things that maybe are less physical, but I am willing to invest in, in the knowledge and skills to do it. Um, universities and vocational schools are now really realizing that they can help educate adults in lifelong learning who can't come to campus, but still want to go to some institution to help them learn these new skills. So I think that the, 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 the possibilities for universities and, and other colleges to serve not just young adults who can come to campus, and they will, by the way. Turns out young adults love coming and being together and having fun in a, in a community, and this is a beautiful city. Uh, I had um, a wonderful di dinner last night uh, with Lila and, and Peter, and they showed me the square, and, and I thought, this would just be a great place to live for four years. So I think residential programs are gonna do fine but in addition to that, serving whole new populations of working adults who might be displaced or want to switch careers is something I think is very much in the future purview of most universities and colleges. So I think it's, it's really exciting, that opportunity. Yeah. I believe we have time for one more question. I see a hand in the back. Hello, everybody. A quick question. The question is, is there a special criteria to accept or add a course at Coursera? Mm -hmm. So can anyone do it? Yeah, the courses that are on Coursera in what we call the public catalog, that's the courses that you can see when you come to Coursera.org. There is a criteria that we use for universities and also for industries. Uh, on universities, that there's an acceptance process that involves an advisory board that we have of other universities. Um, but with respect to what we call private courses, which is uh, the ability for a university or a business or a government to create a course for their population, we, we call that private authoring. Uh, universities, any institution can author courses, any course they would like, put it on Coursera for free, deliver it to any of their constituents for free as well, and we're starting to now see what we call private consortiums, which are groups of schools in a region participating in sort of a course sharing network. 
And so in, those, in the case where they are private courses within a bounded community of one institution or multiple institutions in a region, uh, basically any institution can author and deliver those courses. When it comes to the public catalog, there is an acceptance process, sort of an evaluation process of that institution uh, with our university advisory board. Yeah. Thank you so much. Our time is now over, so thank you for your questions, and thank you once more, Mr. Majin Kalda. It was truly inspiring to listen to you. Thanks. Thanks. And with that, I would like to thank you for your kind attention and for attending our event today. I wish you a pleasant day ahead. Goodbye. <laughs>